a perfect fit. That's what George Santos was called by the man who hired him to work at a business that was on its way to being shut down and accused by the Security Exchange Commission of being, quote, a classic Ponzi scheme, which is to say a criminal enterprise. The SEC is now accusing that Florida business, Harbor City Capital, of having defrauded investors of millions of dollars when the person we now know as Republican Congressman George Santos was hired by that accused classic Ponzi scheme, he had a different name. He was hired at that business under the name George DeVolder. For Republican Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy, who needs every Republican vote he can get in the House, George Santos, or whatever his name is, is a perfect fit for the Republican House of Representatives. Here's what Kevin McCarthy said today. When were you first made aware about some of these allegations around Santos? Was it before they came out publicly in media? Were you given any indication that there might be something amiss there? On which part? Uh, any of it. His uh, resume, I mean, all the things that he's I never know all about his resume or not, but I always had a few questions about it. What about when you, you did the campaign pretending, pretending to be your chief of staff in his solicitation? You know, I didn't know about that. It happened, and I know um, they corrected, but I was not notified about that until uh, a later date. Did you speak to him about it at all? Did yeah, I didn't know about it until a later date, though, unfortunately. Thank you all. Every day. The leader of the Santos party and the House of Representatives should be facing questions like that every day. The Washington Post is reporting that the head of Harbor City Capital, J.P. Maroney, who hired George DeVolder, now known as George Santos, is accused by the Securities and Exchange Commission of using $4.5 million of investor money, quote, for his own personal use, including to buy a Mercedes-Benz and a waterfront home near Cape Canaveral, Florida, the home, a six-bedroom, eight-bathroom, eight 13,000-square-foot mansion, was the location for a fall 2020 fundraiser purporting to benefit President Donald Trump's re-election campaign, according to a planning document obtained by the Post. Four Harbor City employees or associates, including Santos, were listed on the planning document as contacts for the fundraiser, photos from the evening show Maroney was present. The event featured an appearance by Donald Trump Jr. and his fiancee, Kimberly Guilfoyle. The Washington Post reports what happened to some of the people working at that business after it was shut down. After Harbor City shut down and with assistance from a fellow former Harbor City employee, Santos in 2021 formed a company, the DeVolder Organization, that paid him at least $3.5 million over the next two years, according to Florida business records and financial disclosure forms he filed as a candidate. The Post could locate no evidence of a public-facing profile for DeVolder or any record of business activities. Santos loaned his campaign more than $700,000 but did not report any income from Harbor City despite having been paid by the company in 2021. Here is a video of candidate George Santos describing some of his experience doing business in Russia. You show up with $100 and you get 6,000 rubles. And you can do a lot with 6,000. I mean, I've been to Moscow many times during my career. I mean, you stay at the St. Regis on the Red Square, right off the Red Square, next to the Gum Museum, which is the most expensive shopping mall in the World. The New York Daily News is reporting tonight a Russian connection with George Santos. With the lead, controversial Congressman George Santos reportedly scored big bucks donations from a New York real estate kingpin who was a cousin of a Russian oligarch and was once accused of being a go-between in the Stormy Daniels hush money deal. The Daily News points to contributions, also noted by the Washington Post, from Andrew Introtter, who as the Daily News reports, is a cousin and close business associate of Russian oil billionaire Viktor Vekelsberg, a crony of strongman Vladimir Putin, who has been sanctioned by the U.S. government. Introtter, an American citizen, 
also had major business ties to Michael Cohen, the one-time fixer for former President Donald Trump, who did federal prison time for his role in paying porn star Stormy Daniels to keep quiet about her affair with Trump. And Trotter was accused of funneling $500,000 to Cohen as a way of reimbursing him for the hush money payments. His financial firm, Nova Columbus, made several payments in 2017 to the same bank account that Cohen used to pay Daniels on Trump's behalf. There's so many questions I have about what we know and don't know. Do we know what his name is? Is it George Santos or George DeVolder? He's certainly gone by a variety of different names, and it, 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 it fits with the mystery surrounding his background and his biography. We know that DeVolder is his maternal family name. Santos is the name that he has begun using when he got into politics. In some of the video footage that we obtained for this story, he uh, is describing to his colleagues about how he likes to use DeVolder for business and Santos for politics part of his effort to keep these two distinct. Obviously, he ended up not being successful in keeping these two areas of his life so separated. Uh, another thing is income. Uh, we have not seen any tax returns uh, from George Santos. So all we know of his income is what he has put on some sorts of financial disclosure forms as a candidate. Is that right? That's right. We certainly have a lot of questions about how he went from reporting an income of $55,000 in 2020 when he was first a candidate to multiple millions of dollars in 2022 and in a position to loan his campaign more than $700,000. And that's one of the reasons why my colleagues and I thought it was important to investigate this investment firm where he worked and that went entirely unreported on his financial disclosure. Uh, it, it helps fill in some details in what is otherwise largely a professional void for Congressman Santos. Well, you know, I mean, the thing about the $700,000 is it's a legal uh, entry into the campaign if it really is a loan uh, from the candidate. The candidate himself or herself, the audience should know, uh, can contribute or loan unlimited amounts. But no one else can give a campaign $700,000. And so that's why the $700,000 is such an important focus, because if that's not really his money that's going in there, then we have a serious campaign finance violation that is a crime. This is really key, and we've already seen complaints from watchdog groups before the Federal Election Commission alleging that this is not a legitimate loan from a candidate to his own campaign. Rather, it is a form of a straw donor scheme masking many other people or entities, corporations that may have contributed to his campaign and are being reported as a loan from uh, the candidate, now congressman himself. You know, I, I've been to Atlanta a lot, but I've never been to Atlanta on Martin Luther King Day. And I suspect uh, this day in Atlanta has stronger feelings than it might have in other places around the country. Lawrence, um, well, thank you for sharing that with me tonight. I've never heard that speech either. And also the segment before with the color interview with Dr. King. I was just looking at a tweet from Dr. King's youngest daughter today where she tweeted a color picture of her father and herself. And it's those color pictures that remind us how closely we are linked to Dr. King's legacy because it wasn't that long ago. While I wasn't alive in Dr. King's lifetime, I am the beneficiary of his legacy and the work that he did. I was listening to Richard Pryor and he was saying how he didn't have to go through what so many of the leaders went through, but he knows that he would not be where he is today. And Lawrence, I sit here in a seat that was once held by the late Congressman John Lewis in Atlanta in the cradle of the civil rights movement. I sat in Ebenezer Baptist Church today and I listened to Dr. King's youngest daughter, Dr. Bernice King, how she talked about the the history and the legacy of her father and how so many leaders in this country are they will quote a tweet today and t and remember Dr. King on the third Monday in January. But the policies that we're enacting in this country 
could not be more incongruent with the legacy of Dr. King and how much more work we still have to do. So I am, today is always a day since I was a little girl. I grew up in Alabama and I would watch, um, my mom would make us all watch the shows on TV and Little Boy King. And it has a different meaning now, teaching this history to my seven-year-old son and sitting here and living in this space, knowing that I not only have the obligation to continue to tell the stories to my son so that he understands, but the policies that I know that I have to continue to work on as a leader in this country that we're still fighting. Atlanta has the largest racial wealth gap in the country. These are things that Dr. King fought for. And this is what Dr. Bernice King was telling us today. We have to get away from the quotable King and get to the living King. And how do we get out of this convenient space of what feels good and doing the work Work of the people that and the work that isn't always comfortable, but it's necessary to truly uplift Dr. King's legacy. It's much easier to integrate a bus uh, than it is to make genuine integration a reality and quality education a reality in our schools. It's much easier to integrate even a public park than it is to get rid of slums. And I think we are in a new era, a new phase of the struggle, where we have moved from a struggle for decency, which characterized our struggle for 10 or 12 years, to a struggle for genuine equality. Note to viewers who are following on Twitter, I just tweeted the full 16-minute speech by Richard Pryor about Martin Luther King. We showed some excerpts of it moments ago, but the full 16 minutes I now, I just put out on Twitter. Tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern, MSNBC will present a national day of racial healing and MSNBC town hall live from New Orleans with Joy Reid, Chris Hayes, and Tremaine Lee. Tremaine Lee joins us now from New Orleans. Uh, Tremaine, uh, what are you expecting to cover tomorrow night? Lawrence, thank you so much for having me. Um, as I sit here and, and listen to your segment earlier um, about the legacy of Dr. King and the unfinished work of racial healing that sits on our shoulders, I think tomorrow will be a great moment for us uh, to sit and have honest dialogue, come together in good faith, to recognize the work that it has been done, but also the work continuing. Here in New Orleans, there are the scars that keloided over from racial slights past. Like in the Treme neighborhood, um, I spent time talking to folks who were wrestling with what to do with this huge interstate that occupies a space in the heart of the black community that once was lined with big old oak trees and black businesses that have been torn up, dividing Treme. And this interstate, this slab uh, that folks call the monster or a monstrosity, um, has been a symbol of structural racism that has undermined the, the health and well-being and vibrance of that community. And so it's so fitting that the day after we celebrate Dr. King's legacy, that the next day we grapple with the unfinished work. So tomorrow, we're gonna have a lot of great conversations, important conversations, um, you know, from folks who are operating in good faith to help um, so many of us heal, not just those who have borne the brunt of the victimization of, um, you know, racism and white supremacist violence in this country, but also those who have benefited from it in some way. But good faith folks coming together um, we're not under any impression that we will solve uh, racism tomorrow, that we will be healed tomorrow. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for us uh, to, again, living in that legacy of Dr. King and so many other people who wanted to push America forward to be uh, you know, the best that we could possibly be. And so, you know, folks should expect some of that tomorrow. So uh, how does the, the history of New Orleans uh, help contribute to this subject tomorrow night? Well, well, first, I think part of it is framing what has been lost. In order to heal from something, you have to be wounded. Um, New Orleans and Treme in particular has given us everything you love about New Orleans, right? When you think about the only true American art form, jazz music from New Orleans, the great food that everyone loves, the Mardi Gras Indians that everyone loves. Um, and so now what folks are doing around the interstate especially is um, from the trillion-dollar infrastructure bill, some monies are going to communities um, to help, help them mend. Right, especially when it comes to infrastructure racism. And so New Orleans and Treme and that interstate and the wound that it left, and now a moment where the community is coming together from all corners of the city to try to heal around this interstate and figure out what to do with it. Do you use that money to tear it down? Do you beautify it? Do you leave it up as a symbol of what was, but also, um, you know, contextualize it in the current sense to try to move forward? You know, so this, this community is wrestling 
as is America.